Hello, this is Phone Camera Enhancements to Class Grading Interactions and Learning uh, workshop at DVC. And uh, I'm recording this so that we can get through the PowerPoint as fast as possible and move on to the exercises. So here goes. Um, reasons for photographing students' projects are helpful to you. It's an aid to memory. Photographing students with their work helps you better remember the connections between their faces, names, and projects. If your brain has problems with this, like mine does, this artificially fixes the problem. Uh, if a student wants a reference, uh, years later you can look up their past work to refresh your recollection of what they did while they were your student. You can also do grading at home from photos instead of doing this in haste with ephemeral projects, or you can spare yourself from dragging awkward items home or avoid losing or damaging items. Uh, I am completely memory impaired and have uh, a great deal of possibility of losing things. If you've seen the costume studio, which we will tour afterwards, uh, it is an easy place to lose things in, and so uh, I try to move things as little as possible. Uh, also, students like it that they can bring their classwork home as soon as possible after they do a project. Um, it guards against error or loss. If you somehow still lose a grade number for a project, uh, you have a record you can check back on to be sure when a student says, but I did that project to see if they are correct or just think they did it, but never actually turned it in. Uh, the number of times I've had people do projects where they have pictures of it on their phone, they know they did it, but they never bothered to turn it in to me. Uh, I can go and prove that they it isn't there and they can go and prove that it is there by them taking pictures and me taking pictures. So it's a really good thing to get them in the habit of doing and to be in the habit of doing yourself. Uh, it gives you short bursts of time to interact with students individually in a uh, containerized way that uh, is very useful for people like me who have uh, issues with social skills at beginning or ending conversations and things like that. Uh, you can ask questions about the project before you grade it so that you uh, have some sort of concept of what's going on with it. It gives you that little bit of time in which it's sensible and socially appropriate to ask questions in there. Uh, you can compliment things that are worthy of praise to build their confidence so that they get the idea that, yeah, you see it, you appreciate it, you think it's cool. Uh, you can also offer suggestions for improvement right away instead of a week later in a little note. Uh, that way, if it's something where they have been working on it in class, they can go away and come back with it having gotten the improvement and with consequently a better grade, which is handy. Uh, you can also gently assert your authority by telling them where to stand and how to pose, things that are natural for doing while people are doing pictures, but it, it creates a situation where it helps to go and get them used to the notion of doing what you tell them to do and trusting that what weird things you tell them to do may actually turn out to be uh, useful for them. Silly poses that make good pictures convince them you're both fun and guiding them correctly in the way that they're doing. This is a really fantastic picture of someone's makeup that I took by actually standing over her in this weird way and wrapping her in ivy and bits of cloth uh, to go and get that picture. And so she has this fantastic portfolio picture by which I'm sticking her head in the ivy with the bugs. and. The experience of doing something like that with your teacher is kind of fun and uh, weird and helps you to trust that they're guiding you the right way. Uh, this is a thing with somebody uh, hiding under the stairs and doing uh, zombie poses for her cuts and bruises makeup. If you make facial expressions at them, that will look good in the photo, you can get them to consciously or unconsciously mirror your facial expression, which not only improves photos, but is a common acting class method of trust building. Uh, people just tend to do it automatically. When you want to end the interaction, you have a line of people who need to come next so it isn't awkward ending the interaction. 
If students opt into sharing the photos, you have great images for future Canvas class sites and teaching portfolios. Every single page of my uh, Canvas class site for Introduction to Stage Makeup and every single assignment has examples of past uh, assignments uh, for that particular page or assignment or uh, thing that would be going on that day. And it really helps that you have a, a body of things that they can look at and model behavior on the best of the past. Uh, students sharing photos online advertises the class to their friends and relatives. At least a third to a quarter of the people who uh, take my class are people who've been referred by other people who have taken my class. And they, they find out because their friends post their pictures to Facebook and other things. And they say, oh, wow, that sounds like a cool class. And then they sign up for mine. Uh, the longer you do it, the better you get at taking pictures uh, that are flattering of people and their work, which can improve your own home and work photography. Here's my aunt blowing out the candles on her birthday cake, and here's a hot glue crown of my own that I've gotten better at taking pictures of. Uh, it's also just plain fun. Uh, the more you do it, the more you play with it, the more it becomes this uh, intriguing thing, and more the students have fun with it. Uh, the reason students find it useful, they too have a time when they can get your attention in a way that does not require speaking up or interrupting. It's an easy time for the shy to ask questions and bring up issues. The process gives them direct individual attention so they don't go through a class never being sure if the teacher knows you exist. Uh, if you share your photos with the students, they get portfolio shots of their work and fun shots to share on social media, which they love. They get timely suggestions and praise. If there's a problem with an in-class project, there often is time to tweak it before it's turned in for a grade. They can often take projects home right away so that they don't get lost or damaged in transit. If they lose or break the project later, they still have a record of it. You can subtly train them to pose better for pictures over time, which they will find useful in taking other pictures. I've had many students in the past saying, I did photo shoots and I always know how to stand and I know how to do this now. Uh, you can gradually educate them about how to take better photos of others and or objects in your discipline by talking to them about what you're doing while you're doing it. It makes them more relaxed as they know why you're doing the crazy things that you're doing and uh, they learn. Students rarely get photos posed with things that they make or in groups with their fellow students. Yet years later, these sort of photos are greatly valued memories and it is fun. Uh, the ingredients you will need, a cell phone camera. Uh, you don't need a really new fancy spiffy one. Uh, you Anything af like eight years ago is more than adequate. Uh, I, I think an iPhone 4 four uh, was my first iPhone and it had a better camera in it than what most of the AFI top 100 films in history were filmed with. So uh, cell phone cameras are your friend for this. You don't need to go out and buy a new fancy one. There are new fancy ones, but uh, you don't actually need to get the best of the line. Whatever you've got in your phone will probably do. Um, you need, however, to find a location in or near your classroom with diffused light. That's the single thing you have to go and find. You need to poke around uh, your classroom and poke around outside your classroom in the hallway or outside the door uh, in, in a spot with diffused or indirect light. Um, Outdoors isn't usually great. You don't want direct sunlight, but if you can, if there's a spot near your door where you can duck out and there's a shade tree, you have found a, a place with diffused light. Uh, so you want to avoid backlight and you want to avoid, avoid spotty light, but uh, nothing else. Uh, other ingredients. You need to have some sort of method that you use for sorting files. I do it on my PC. I just make myself file folders and do it that way because I have two terabytes of this kind of data that I have stored over the years and uh, I need to make a system to do that. Uh, there are, however, programs that can help you do this depending on your uh, machine. Macs have some sort of thing that people who like Macs 
like to do. Uh, it doesn't matter what form you do. You just need to have a format that you can mentally remember where you put things. Uh, now, if you want to go and uh, share your photos with your students, which you want to do, um, I'm most partial to Shutterfly uh, because it's free. It uploads unlimited large size files. It lets you sort your photos with your own chosen file names. Uh, I like to put the pictures on at full resolution so that they can get them that way. Uh, I also am partial to the fact that they don't charge. They just have products that you can conveniently get that are fairly high quality, if a little expensive, uh, to buy magnets and books and cheap prints and things like that. And that's how they support themselves uh, instead of the usual thing where they kind of co-opt your images. Um, you can see my Shutterfly site at the address on the screen. And uh, you can also go and do this at Flickr, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, and others listed. The reason you want to go and uh, share stuff with students is because that will A, make them more cooperative in taking the pictures, and B, will make them happier and will be a good thing to do for your students as they can build up their portfolios and have records of their work and all that good stuff. Uh, you do want to check with the students because inevitably there will be one or two people who don't want their pictures online. And what I do is I put, um, I tell them on the first couple of days of class that they should circle their name in the class list. And that's a sort of secret sign. They don't have to tell me why or whatever, whether they have a stalker or whether they just don't like social media or they have a job where they don't want to admit that they do strange things and make up on weekends, <laughs> whatever. Uh, they, they just uh, circle it and then I make a separate file folder in, within the class file of that semester that is for putting their pictures in. I put them in there, I save them on my uh, hard drive, and then I go and uh, uh, put them in that separate place and not online and just make a copy of it at the end of the semester on a DVD that they can go and take home with them if they want. Um, Another thing that's optional is getting a folding photo box or a cloth or some other thing that you can use to make a sort of diffused special place for photographing small objects uh, with backgrounds that aren't distracting and with the best possible lighting. Uh, those are really handy, especially if you have small objects that you need to photograph uh, or if you have shiny objects that you need to photograph. Uh, like things out of metal and whatever. Um, then, how to do it. Uh, take smiling mug shots of your class on the first day and make a cheat sheet connecting faces to names. That's the main reason that got me started doing this. Uh, you use the cheat sheet to identify who is turning in an assignment simply by photographing the assignment with the person who made it. Uh, you get in close to the person or object so that it fills most or all of the frame. Uh, if students turn homework in at the beginning of class, ideally take photos of the items while they work in the studio, then have them come by before exiting to be photographed with the item before they leave with it. That way they take it away, you don't keep it, you don't lose it, there's no problem with that. Uh, the photos get taken, then the photo with them gets taken that helps identify it, and that's a good way to go if you have the time to do that during their lab. Uh, if students are turning in work as they finish it in the studio, arrange for students to come and line up with their work to be photographed as they finish it, ideally. Uh, show them the photos also, cull the blinkies, uh, so that they can object to things that they don't like. They don't like the way they're looking that day. Oh, my hair is terrible, whatever. Uh, you want to get enough of a face in the photo that you can identify whose is what. Uh, however, um, you don't want to go and post shots like this online or they'll stop wanting to have you take their pictures. Uh, I usually actually have them look through my camera as I'm going. I show them uh, picture after picture and then they say, no, no, I want that one, I don't want that one, I want that one, I don't want that one, and I get rid of all the ones that they hate. And that builds trust. 
Um, if you can't take the photos within the class time, you can collect it, but still photograph it in your office or your studio before you leave so it need not endure transport and you don't lose or break anything or have to carry awkward stuff. Uh, just it's easier and safer, if at all possible, to do it that way. Uh, when photographing work with the student in the photo, concentrate primarily on getting a good photo of the student. The student with assignment photo is primarily a name tag for the other photos, and having a flattering face photo relaxes the student and builds trust, is more likely to be shared via social media, advertising or class, and makes better photos for Canvas. For the same reason, it doesn't hurt to go and do group shots if people want to be photographed with their friends that all worked on the same project together. That kind of thing is a good PR and, uh, again, helps you better connect names to faces and groups of people and so on. Now, getting flattering faces, photos of faces, ones that people will actually like to have pictures of so that they'll share them and help uh, promote your class by having little pictures of them with their faces holding their projects in them uh, that they will spread around and help to uh, recruit for your class. Uh, Cell phone cameras are actually fisheye cameras. If you get very close, a fisheye camera enlarges whatever is closest to the lens. This lets you emphasize whatever features flatter the student. Um, so if you angle down from the top, you get a huge forehead and a tiny chin. If you angle up from the bottom, it makes a tiny forehead and huge chin. So obviously people who have no chin are better slightly angled from above. People who have a big chin are sometimes, uh, or, or, no, sorry, people who have no chin are better if they're angled up, and people who have too much chin are sometimes better angled down. Um, close to one eye enlarges the eye and cheekbone, uh, which except on, there are some girls who have already kind of cartoonishly large eyes, and if you do that to them, they look kind of like anime drawings. <laughs> But um, for most people, this is actually a fairly flattering look. Uh, close to the nose enlarges the nose. It uh, doesn't look terribly pronounced on mine because I have a little nose, but uh, you got to watch it on that one uh, for people who already have big noses. Uh, straight on, close up and centered makes the nose slightly larger, which is fine in my case as I've got a little nose. And the sides of the face recede, making the face look thinner, which therefore is for people who have sort of big square faces like my, mine uh, is usually a little bit flattering. Uh, however, for most people, uh, down angles in three-quarter profile nearest one eye, but not too near, uh, tend to flatter most people and slightly feminize faces. Uh, studies have shown that people like slightly feminized faces uh, better than ones that are more aggressively masculine looking for the most part. Uh, so getting in close to the face from above uh, usually helps make the face also be thinner looking, and have less jaw and so on. So it, it tends to be a little more flattering, as you can see on most people. Uh, up angles make jaws look bigger and more masculine, so they tend to be good angles for men with big eyes and a smaller jaw, as it gives them more chin. Doing this on a person with small eyes and a big chin will make them look like a cartoon caveman, though. So when you want to go and give somebody a little more chin and they don't have uh, little tiny eyes that shooting up from the bottom will look bad, you can get a very nice uh, picture of them that way. Um, to make thin-faced people who have kind of beaky noses uh, look good, you want to actually stand further away and zoom in to widen and flatten the face, because if you get in close, you will make their skinny face with a, a larger nose look even larger nosed and beakier. So you get further away and you zoom in. And this goes and widens and flattens the face and de-emphasizes the nose. And it also has a little bit of an airbrush effect. Uh, you can see in these pictures, the airbrush effect is caused by the makeup. This is how I get uh, the difference between the mugshot photos I do with people at the beginning of the semester and the photos I do of their, quote, corrective makeup. 
to look so much better from one to the other. Uh, they're not really that good in the semester at doing their corrective makeup uh, when they start out, so I use the camera to cheat a little and make it look better. Uh, you can see this uh, effect a little more easily in these pictures. Uh, when we do Asian makeup, uh, half the people in the class, or more than half the people in the class, are some ethnicity other than Asian. And Asian makeup tends to look really good on Asian faces. Well, if you get in close to the face, like the two pictures on the left, you get that more skinny oval thing happening with the face. So what we do is we step back and zoom in and it widens and flattens the face and makes it look more like the Asian faces that the makeup was originally designed for. So the, the ones on the left are up fairly close to the face with the camera and the ones on the right are with the camera further away and zoomed in and that gives you an oval round. Obviously this is not a good look for somebody who is already very stout in the face. Uh, if you have a person with both a heavy jaw or a double chin and a large forehead, you can take the photo at a down angle to minimize the jaw and enlarge the eyes, but have the frame cut off the forehead just above the eyebrows so the down angle won't make a space alien head with a giant forehead. This is the cat trick I use to make faces more triangular for cat makeup. Uh, you can see above these, the two pictures are straight on, and this shows the usual sort of oval look that you get from straight on and about mid distance. However, uh, this is where I tilt down, and we get bigger eyes, narrower chin, and then I use the edge of the camera to go and chop out part of the forehead so that the forehead doesn't get up too big. And then you get a sort of triangular shaped face, which is terrific when you're trying to do makeup to look like cats, but it also is terrific for people who have a heavy jaw and uh, uh, yet need to be made thinner looking by being up close. So it gives them bigger eyes and narrower jaw. Uh, there's also some software you can use uh, in post uh, on your camera phone uh, that is very cheap. Uh, the two ones that I recommend the most are More Beauty 2 and Photolab Pro. More Beauty 2 is essentially something that does fill flash lighting. It lightens the mid-tones and smooths out the edges of the skin. So slightly imperfect brush work in the makeup or slightly zitsy or wrinkly skin gets a little bit airbrushed out. And the um, uh, mainly the lighting is put in so that there isn't so much odd little shadows that you get in photographing somebody in a hallway. Uh, you get something that looks kind of like studio lighting in just a few seconds. So it's a very cheap app and it will not only help your students to like their pictures better if you do that occasionally, uh, you also will find that uh, it's a very popular one with elderly aunts and things when you're taking photos at Thanksgiving. So. Uh, Photolab Pro is just a fun app, specifically for messing with portraits. It is not necessary, but again, it can make portraits that students are more likely to share. I've messed about with about two to three dozen photo FX filters and frame programs over the years. Actually, I just, it's like something I do compulsively. Uh, but this one makes some really eye-popping portraits out of fairly ordinary images, again, for less than the cost of coffee. The main thing that it costs you is time, but it is addictive. It's a lot of fun to go and take fairly ordinary portraits uh, like you see on the left and then uh, run them through various filters and have them turn into stuff that they can't resist sharing on social media. Now, uh, we're gonna move on to the five exercises. Uh, I'm going to describe them all and then I will let you all run amok and do them. Uh, exercise one, pull out your phone camera and try taking close-up selfies at different angles to see how you can use the camera to emphasize one set of features and minimize others. Learning how to do that is easiest to do with your own camera on your own face, seeing it, and then you can look at somebody's face later and analyze it and figure out what part do I really want to analyze and how can I move the camera around to get a better picture of that person. 
Uh, exercise two will be where you take your phone and wander through the basement down here uh, for five minutes taking selfies in assorted places with different lighting conditions. And you're gonna figure out the places where you get the most diffused light and least amount of shadows. That's all you're gonna do. It'll take you less than five minutes, I suspect. Uh, exercise three, when you find yourself in one of the puddles of diffused light with other people, because there's only a few puddles of diffused light that you can find, uh, you will share your selfies with one another and look and see what they think. Then swap phones with a partner and take turns taking photos of each other at assorted angles and zoom distances. Try to get at least one good portrait of your partner by trying the different angles and the zooms and the different ways you can go and do that. Just play with a partner and keep doing that until you get something good of each. Uh, then exercise four will be, you will get your phone back from your partner and come back into the makeup room to pick up a quote project. Return to the pool of diffused light to photograph your partner holding the object. Try to make the frame entirely filled with the project and the face of your partner. This is how you would do these uh, faces and name tag uh, things. And then the last thing is you'll bring the objects back into the makeup room and also the men's dressing room next door. And you'll try out the various types of setups for photographing different objects, which I will madly be uh, putting up uh, as you go and uh, do the other stuff. So you will try out any object that is near the size or reflectivity of assignments you typically receive from students and practice taking photos with them in different kinds of setups. And those are the five exercises. And when you're done, you can run away or you can stay and I will give you a tour of the theater. That is all. Thank you.